I just want to say thank you all very much for this fantastic presentation. Uh, Gord has presented this before. It was super the first time, but I have to say with the extra guests, it's um, it's made it even more special. So grazie mille a tutti. Thank you all so very much. Um, I just want to start the panel discussion um, with that first question, because I think that's kind of the natural question to ask after the apology on the 27th of May. So we know that the government of Canada has apologized uh, officially in the house. Um, what was going through your mind? Like, how did that make you feel? And I, I wanted to ask the, the descendants of the, um, the internees if I could. So why don't we start with Trina? When the prime minister announced about, I guess about two weeks prior to that, the, announced the date, I, um, I keep the sketch of my grandfather in our family room. And I looked at him and I said, it's coming. Um, this had been something that had, had been in our family for so many years with my father, I think being the prime uh, person to just sort of carry on the legacy. And when he was, dying 20 years ago I promised him that I would keep up the charge and I did so to me it was it was very very special um, but there still is lots of work to be done um, and one of my main components is to create educational awareness but to see the apology announced that it, it was finally due it was a long time coming but uh, I was I was very very pleased with that awesome thank you and Mr. Lindsay well, you know, this is all new to me till a year ago till I first talked to Gord. I didn't think it was that much. Uh, I've got a lot more interested in it since our conversations and that. And uh, the only thing I could think of was when the government apologized that they did a lot, lot too late. The people that they interned and the families that they hurt, uh, you know, 70 years ago, they were the people that suffered. And, and I'm just uh, uh, next generation. And then it was my father and my aunts and that that had to, to stay home and work and uh, keep the farm. Like Gord said, the, my grandfather was lucky. He had kids that could uphold the establishment there and uh, lots of them didn't in the end. In, and I got to meet a lot of grandfather's friends that he, he met in internment camps. And uh, they lost everything. The friends of his in Vancouver, Nino Cell. And uh, people from Trail that died. I went back with him, drove him back when he was older to visit them. And uh, so he, he, he got friends from it, I guess. And, uh, but, my, I always felt bad for my dad and my uncle because they quit school at 14 years old to run the family farm. You know, they didn't have much of a chance in life for education or anything like that. They, they, they were the guys that had to do the, the grunt. So yeah, uh, I was, it made me realize uh, how hard they had it and how much more I appreciate them today. No kidding. Thank you for that. I, that's a big key issue here is not only were these gentlemen interned, it was the people who were left behind. And we've talked about the wives and, you know, kind of what they had to do to pick up the pieces. But often it was the kids who had to be taken out of school because they needed to go to work to support the family. Um, in your case, it was farming in the urban centers. They would work, you know, as young as 10 years old and in, in grocery stores or, you know, running errands or whatever. I, as a mom, I, I can't even imagine having my kids at 10 years old or even 14 years old having to take over and, and earn a living so that, you know, you can put bread on the table. It's um, the humanity is, is amazing. Um, so oh, Graham, I'm just going to jump in for a sec. If anyone of the audience uh, wants to put a question, could you put it in the chat box and I'll just kind of monitor that while Roseanne's talking and then, you know, when appropriate, uh, we'll kind of jump in and put those questions to the panel. Thanks. Sorry, Roseanne. No problem. Um, uh, again, on the apology, do you all feel it was enough? I mean, 
took a long time. You know, we we first had an, uh, an unofficial apology in 1990, and it was directed to the um, National Congress of Italians um, informally. Um, Adriana, how do you feel about that? Well, I want to go back to the work that led to that first apology. Um, in um, 1988, the Japanese were successful after 20 years of fighting um, at to, for redress and a settlement was given. I mean, they lost, property was taken away from them. They were, entire families were moved into the interior of BC and Southern Alberta, as you know. And in 1988 was when uh, the second Rome conference on immigration happened. And uh, I was the president of the National Congress of Italian Canadians, Edmonton District. And there were, of course, Congresses across the country, as well as the Ottawa Congress. And I think that on that trip, well, we had two meetings. Uh, we met in New York with the American delegates, and then we met in Toronto, just the Canadian delegates. And uh, so that, you know, the Canadian um, leadership of the National Congress has got to know each other and bonded. And I think that is when the brief for the first apology began. And the lead person on that was um, Anna Maria Castrilli, who was a young Italian lawyer, who at that point was on the board of uh, the University of Toronto. Eventually she would become the chair of the board. But the brief was circulated among the various um, regional congresses and that, you know, so that it was a collective, I mean, it was, drafted really by the le leadership in Toronto and Montreal, but all of us got to shape it in some way. And so there, the, there was that push. And that then in 1990, spring of 1990, when the biannual of the National Congress was hosted uh, by the Toronto Congress, and of course we, we met at the university, various University of Toronto facilities, but we went out of town for this luncheon. Now we all knew uh, the, the leadership that uh, Prime Minister Mulroney was going to be attending. And he did attend and he, he made a very good apology and that it was not intended to be an unofficial apology, that the next step would have been to present it in Parliament, and that then, that then there would have been a piece of legislation that would have dealt with the address, the redress, sorry. Now, this did not happen. And so that you then had to have the um, Italian, um, MPs who, who led with the effort within the House, because the community as a whole through the National Congress did the external lobbying and the preparation of the brief. Um, so there were, were various steps. Um, in 1995, I believe, was when the Ukrainians then received a settlement. And with their settlement, the Canadian government moved away from reparations to individuals. And so I think that they were given 10 million that went into a foundation to support educational um, uh, projects. By 2008, there was another effort, but under Paul Martin, um, a general grant program was set up really for um, Europeans who had been impacted by um, internment. The government no longer wanted to deal one on one with communities at that point. So then we get into the uh, Villa Charities Columbus Center 
project, 2012-2013, uh, that um, Gord referred to. And I was part of that. I helped to draft the grant application that was submitted to the Government of Canada. And then the funding was assigned. And it had a, a number of projects. One of them was an extensive research project and that um, I, I was not only part of the steering committee, but I was also the researcher for the prairies. And uh, Ray Koulos was the representative for, for British Columbia and I, got, and I got to know him well, as well as the other researchers. So the products were um, the website, a permanent exhibit in the Columbus Center, a traveling exhibit that went across the country, um, and then this multimedia website that included the oral histories that we did with descendants of internees, and then uh, two publications um, done by Wernicke Press. One was Beyond Barbed Wire, and the other one was uh, by Canadian, Italian Canadian writers. And there's also then the statue at the Columbus Center. But we get back to then, there are people who expected some kind of financial reparations. And the, the difficulty of making the Italian case is that assets were not seized like they were for the Japanese. And, and with Ukrainians, of course, in the First World War, assets had not been seized, generally speaking. So you're, the government doesn't want to get into making reparations to the families of the, you know, to the descendants. And so they, uh, so my sense is we're not going to see financial settlement. The National Congress did not embed financial reparations into the brief. And we had discussions around it because there was a division. I mean, and on the one hand, there are the people who wanted the apology, that it's a moral issue and that it needed to be addressed. That's why for me, it was important in parliament for the prime minister and the leader of the opposition and others to make that apology because it is important. And I'm so glad that, you know, descendants that you, you've, you've said that and you've spoken from the heart. In terms of reparations, I don't think it's going to happen. And then that brings the issue. When the apology was made in 1990, a group of Italian Canadian academics um, in um, Ontario and, and Quebec universities initiated research projects. And there have been a number of publications coming out of, of, of that research. And that it's that generation that gave us a huge amount of detail, including you know, naming the informants and so on. And I consider myself a part of that generation of academics, although, of course, I've written about it later. My book has, has just come out, although I've done research over the years. I first wrote about this around 2002. Now, yes, there were fascists, but when I'm when I was asked this question by Global and, and CBC, I qualified that by saying that I didn't think that any of them were particularly interested in sabotaging the Canadian war effort and doing damage, you know, which is the, the, the you know, the enemy within. But there were hardcore fascists. There is no doubt about it. And Gord, you know the interesting, you, po you pointed out the Roman numerals. Um, Gabriele Scardellato, who of course has written about this, and, and of course we lost him, as you know, last year. Um, you know, and I've had the pleasure of knowing him for years and, and discuss this with him that he's done an analysis of, you know, those photographs in the camp at Gagetown 
And remember, the people who, who, who were in the internment camps for three to five years were definitely hardcore fascists. And that he's done a study of the pictures and that when you look at the pictures, there are various signs and signals the way that um, certain of the fascist officials, and he names these people, and, and um, in terms of Alberta, it, it uh, was Antonio Rebaudengo from Calgary. He served three full years, and he, his letters were preserved, and so I had this diary to draw on. Um, and, and so in these photographs, you know, the notion of a collegio, a there was a fascist leadership in the camp in Petawawa, and that then those people then continued to serve some until 1945. So I think I should stop now. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, let me give uh, Lynn a, a, an opportunity to jump in there because um, that's a nice segue into kind of the historical context. Um, Lynn, there was some media coverage talking about the apology that it might be whitewashing history um, by absolving people who were, you know, admitted fascists at the time. Um, how do you feel about that? Like, how, what's your thoughts? Well, um I'm really glad to have just heard what Adriana had to say, that there were, in fact, a few fascists, not a lot, but certainly I uncovered several people who not only were in Kananaskis, but sent on to Petawawa and later on to Gagetown, which I assume is where all the hardcore people ended up. Yeah. Um, I, I, just, I, I just would like to add two or three things. I have to, unfortunately, I have to leave. I'm on holidays and my family is... Uh, is waiting for me, but um, I'd just like to mention just a couple of things. Um, prior to World War II, uh, as, as one Italian person said to me, it was not very uh, sexy to be an Italian in Canada. And it, it, over the years, there had been a lot of, of um, uh, government and, and uh, industrial persecution, uh, uh, making things very difficult for Italians. So there certainly was a... Um, a hotbed of, of resentment perhaps that could be built upon. I'd also like to mention that I've, I've gone through all the security bulletins that the RCMP kept during the thirties and they are absolutely not interested in fascists at all until 1939. They're only interested in communists. So the RCMP didn't seem to see that there was any problems with being a fascist. And that at that time, uh, and the third thing I want to add is nothing to do with history at all, except my own history. In 1946, my family uh, moved into the Kananaskis camp, and we spent our summers there for five years uh, when it became a forestry camp again. So I've even played in the watchtowers. <laughs> what a wonderful crazy. story. <laughs> so it's come full circle. Thank you so much, Lynn. appreciate you coming in. You're welcome. Enjoy your time with your family. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to say, um, you know, I'm a 60s chick and I was born in Canada. I'm ashamed to say I didn't know anything about this subject. Uh, I kind of sort of remember in the fog of my mind, the apology in 1990. And only because I think I was involved in the Italian club at the time. And I think there's a lot of people who are in my shoes. They you know, this kind of presentation is super key for us. Uh, the information is very important and it gives context to kind of where we're coming from, from a lot of different angles. Um, I think the apology creates a little bit of an awareness. Um, how did, did, did it get enough coverage? Like, do you think that people across the country kind of got the message? Did they care? You know, uh, who can I pick on this time? How about Trina? How do you feel about that? I think it got a lot of national coverage in terms of, uh, you know, the national news at night. And uh, I did a couple of interviews with Omni here and uh, Chin Radio. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a one-time occurrence. And the next day, something else comes about. And, you know, um, as we sadly saw the next day, 
there was the discovery of the 215 um, grave sites. And um, so, I mean, that has captured the news for the last week right now, and, and rightly so. Um, that's, where, um, that's where I come about in terms of um, creating awareness, because I have spoken to many people, um, you know, um, of Italian background and elsewhere. They, they never learned it in school. I know I never learned it in school. I have a history major. It was never taught to me. Um, and so it's to tell that story. And when I became president of the local chapter of the Congress, and I know Adriana talked about the National Congress. So yes, at one time, the national head office was in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. And then in the 80s, it, um, it moved to, I think it was switched between Montreal and Toronto. Um, and so I head up the, the local chapter of it's called the National Capital District. And um, so when I became its president in 2016, I made it a point of um, telling that story as many times as I, I could. We had an information night one evening. Um, we screened Piazza Petawawa. Um, I have a small part in that um, because I got to know the director. Uh, and it's a, it's a wonderful uh, film to take a look at. Um, I'm going to be working alongside with one of our local associations. I believe they're going to be screening Il Duce Canadese sometime later this month. And um, so it's about getting that story out there and, and letting people know. So did it receive coverage? Yeah, the national media had it for a little bit of time, but, but they move on because news is, uh, news is evergreen, right? Yeah, that's true. Adriana, do you have any other comments on that one? Well, you know, I think that people are now complaining about the number of apologies that uh, Trudeau has made and that, you know, the culture of victimhood and that, you know, with the enormity of residential school and, um, indigenous uh, systemic racism, that if we're going to level the playing field, then that has to be the top of the agenda. But in terms of my book, you know, the first chapter looks at, you know, um, the Italians were at, at the bottom of the pecking ladder of, of, you know, of desirable immigrants. I mean, you know, they were slightly above, you know, Eastern Europeans and Blacks and Jews and, and Indigenous people who were at, at the bottom. So I think that, Trina, we have to educate within the Italian community. I agree with you totally. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, we have to tell these stories, but also in the context of the larger immigration narratives. Because I think that, you know, why um, the apologies and reparations to the Japanese and the, then the Ukrainians and so on happened was because of multiculturalism policies and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, where you all of a sudden, you don't have second class citizens. That doesn't mean you, they were banished. <laughs> But at least in a, within the legal framework, there were no second class citizens. And that that and the respect of the ethnicity, culture, religion, you know, which is what multiculturalism was about. And that was a huge shift, you know, under Pierre Elliott Trudeau to move from bilingualism and biculturalism, you know, the two official cultures to expand it. And then in terms of indigenous activism, you know, the founding nations theory that Canada has become much more complex. And so I think that the Italian story is a part of our country becoming more aware and, and become, becoming hopefully more equitable. Fair enough, thank you. Um, so given all of that, you both mentioned that, you know, we need to kind of expand that awareness. 
how do we expand that awareness within the Italian community? I mean, we've got this lovely presentation. We also started our legacy project in which we film, you know, the stories of our pioneers and our founding members and our, you know, people who began, who were involved in the first Italian club. Um, that's our legacy. That's what we're working on. But how do we get that message to everybody else, um, uh, you know, in all of the other communities? I mean, there's a healthy Italian population in British Columbia, in Kamloops, in Trail, in Vancouver, for sure. Um, how do we get that message across? Well, I applaud you. I mean, I think that... Uh, you know, you, that you lead by example. Because what I see in, in Alberta, and I discuss this in my book, is that, you know, those, the, my father's generation, you know, who came in the late 40s and early 50s, they're all dead. So that, you know, we're the elders. And unless we can pass on th those stories, to our children and grandchildren, that knowledge is, is not go, going to go anywhere. And that as a historian, I was able to draw on oral histories going back to 1978, 79, when the Dante Alighieri Society, one of the founding societies in Edmonton, did oral history projects. Then in 1983, that's how I got involved the local priest wanted to do a 25th anniversary um, series of celebrations for the parish, Santa Maria Goretti. I was an editor on the Canadian Encyclopedia and had some profile. He contacted me. The next thing I knew, I was volunteering. We created a society. We did oral histories because you have to do those projects. You have to capture the knowledge in the first place and create it and um, give it a digital form. And, and I'm gonna make a, a, a pitch for the Italian Canadian Archives project, ICAP, which includes a number of universities and, and has some branches across the country that I think that, you know, and they want this documentation accessible uh, digital. They don't have any money, but there is a capacity to apply for grants. But I think it's building those sources of knowledge so that then we can have the next generations of historians will have this information to deal with, but also the families will have it. Right. Okay. Thank you. So I'm going to give the last word to Mr. Lindsay. Uh, sir, what do you think are the lessons that can be carried on from, from this exercise, from this apology, the acknowledgement of the internees? Well, like I said before, I was, my family never talked about it. Uh, my father sure didn't. My uncle, Pete, never, never said a word about it. I learned things from my grandfather. Uh, I wished I'd asked more questions. Uh, you know, my mother told me a few things about uh, the deal that what my father and my uncle went through. But uh, there was a lot more things I would I'd like to know, and I I didn't even think about it till like Gord contacted me, and and I, and I think it's uh, it's kind of up to me and my family, the Lindsays, that, that I make sure that uh, um, my sons and nephews and nieces all know about it, because this is a part of their history. They 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 they, they don't they probably don't even know, eh? And uh, yeah, it's it's good. It's a good eye opener for my side of the family to, to dig into it and uh, learn as much as we can, share as much information as we can, so that they all know the, the history of their their family. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, do we have any more time, Gord? Or are we there? We're. We're about eight minutes away from nine o'clock. Um, so we'll maybe do like a very quick uh, last words from our panelists and then we'll wrap up for the evening. So Trina, maybe we'll go to you. Any, any last words you wanna leave us with? 
Um, I, well, I think it's been a, a wonderful um, experience, a wonderful evening, um, and um, very grateful to be on uh, a panel with, um, with so many knowledgeable people, um, and as well, um, you know, a, another family member. Um, I've had the opportunity, uh, I guess, this past two months to meet many family members just by email or by telephone uh, sitting on a committee. And I, I see my one of my colleagues, Maria Morano, is, is in on this uh, Zoom call tonight um, from, uh, from British Columbia, the National Congress president. And I've had the opportunity to meet with her. And um, I can say that the, the National Congress and the Order of the Sons and Daughters of Italy and Chifa are working um, hard following this apology to get that um, notice to the government that education has to be a big part of this. And so if I have to leave anything, it's the fact that these stories need to be told. Thank you. Um, Ray, uh, we, we did hear from you. Did you have anything else you wanted to add? Uh, just thank you guys very much for including me and uh, digging up all this information. You did a lot of hard work and I appreciate it. Um, one quick word about that. I actually got uh, Federico's uh, file from, um, I'm going by memory, is it the Museum of Human Rights in Winnipeg, I believe? Uh, Travis Tomchuk Travis. Yeah. was the guy who did it. So if you do, if, if there is a family connection, Travis was very helpful. He sent me, uh, he sent me the file number. I had to order it uh, from the government. I think it was like $15 or something like that. But uh, it, that's where we got all the information. And I know there is a number of Ray's family on the Pearsons and the, the Favalis and that that are on this. And they very much appreciated kind of getting that information. Um, so yeah, that that is another potential one. And I also encourage anyone who wants to find out more, um, contact me directly. Um, it's just KCIC. I'll just give you the KCIC at shaw.ca. It'll get forwarded to me and it's easier to remember. Um, and we'll, we'll try to point you in the right direction. Um, actually, Trina did mention uh, Maria Murano. Um, Maria, can I, can I impose on you to say a quick word if you unmute yourself? Um, first and foremost, I just wanted to say um, to the whole of um, obviously yourself and the Kelowna Club. This has been an amazing presentation and I'm, I was honored to have been invited um, and of course to be in, in um, a company of these amazing panelists and everybody here today and definitely my heart goes out to the families and I can't wait to learn more um, you know, as we move forward. But um, just to kind of ride a little bit on your coattails there, I think that as Trina was saying, um, I think what we can do now, and as Adriana was saying, and Roseanne and, and everyone, is that we can now help. Where? What do you need us to do? What do the families need us to do? Maybe, um, you know, in the Pacific region, uh, we can work together to find the information for the families. As Adriana was saying, and, and of course my background, um, you know, in, in writing grants as well and getting money and, you know, maybe that's the route that we go where we can help the families. We get a few dollars and we go out and get the information for the families. But I think now working together across Canada, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited to be back. And then again, thanks to Joey and Francesco and, you know, God bless them um, to asking me to come back um, to the Congress. But I, I think that um, this is an exciting time um, for our um, children and, and, our, uh, and even my grandchildren, you know, for looking forward um, you know, and, and keeping a memoir of, um, of the history of the Italian Canadians uh, across Canada. So uh, I am excited. I think there's a lot that we can do. And again, working together, um, you know, and, uh, and giving this to the families, you know, it's, it's something that we can, uh, we can give to them. And, and I, I don't like the word closure, because I don't think there's ever closure. In, uh, with any of this, you know, and, and even certainly the things that are happening, you know, in the last few days, right? Um, but at least we can give some solace to the families that, you know, of, um, of the history uh, of their families. So that's what I wanted to say. And thank you again. This has been absolutely amazing. Adriana. Well, I, I 
had my final word. Thank you. Uh, this is wonderful. I applaud you on your presentation and I applaud you on all of your historical initiatives. Um, a word to Maria. Maria, I'd love to talk to you and um, Gord will give you my email address and, and uh, we, can, we can set something up, okay? All right. Well, I, thank you all. This was uh, kind of an ambitious undertaking for an online presentation, and I found I was a little too ambitious. I was trying to juggle a little too much. Next time, we'll smooth that out a little bit more. You'd think I'd know Zoom by now, um, but I had no idea my cursor would disappear when I started showing a slideshow. Um, but thank you all uh, for joining us. I think this was the beginning of a hopefully very important and ongoing conversation. Um, I had such, it was so rewarding to me to help um, Ray and his family kind of unearth a piece of their family history um, that was that they were in, in a lot of cases unaware of before. Um, and this is a really important conversation because um, I think Adriana said it, we, we don't want any second class citizens ever in Canada. Everyone has to be equal. So, yes. Um, Gord, just, uh, just to let you know, after the war, the government of Canada stated that it would destroy the records, the RCMP records yeah. of the internees so that it would not prejudice their future um, in, in any way. What is interesting is that um, I went to Library and Archives Canada as part of my research. And of course, Antonio de Valdengo's file was destroyed. However, some of the two were released within um, the two year period, because as you saw, when Hindman began to hear appeals and they saw that they did not have enough information and, that's, and the files revealed that, then they were released. And some of those files, and Travis of course did a, a lot of research. He was one of the lead researchers for the, the project. And so that's why he had the Lindsay file. But you, but you, you're not going to find files for everybody. Just a heads up. It's I think only the ones that were considered really small fry and were released relatively early might you be able to find. Okay. Uh, actually, Gordon, can I make one oh, comment? God. Okay. Th thank you. Um, as someone who's involved with board on the research side of things. I'm really glad to see what happened tonight is putting all this together and seeing it take a life of its own. So thank you to the panelists and Gord for your presentation. I have one question for Trina. Are you my cousin? So I'll get that email to you. We share it and share we'll, a common name. We'll, so we never know. We'll find, we'll find that out. Okay, good. Just, 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 so you know, Trina, just so you know, Trina, Don says that to absolutely everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's got the right name though here. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody. Thank you all so very much for coming on behalf of the Kelowna Canadian Italian Club. I appreciate everybody coming into the presentation. It was great. Uh, I think it was more than great, actually. It was pretty darn special. Lovely to have everybody from across the country uh, chiming in. Who knows? Maybe we'll do this again. Thank you all so much for coming. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Thank everybody. You.